Hello, everyone, and thank you, Mario, for that Oof, extremely kind uh, introduction. So, human center feasibility restoration. What on earth does that mean? Who cares about it? And why is it important? Okay, let's start with the beginning. What on earth does that mean? Or as we call it, academics, the background. Um, okay, so I'm talking about combinatorial problems. They can be satisfaction and optimization, but all my examples are going to be optimization because that's what I do. Um, combinatorial problems, and by that I mean, just so that we're on the same thing, find a combination of choices that satisfies a set of constraints and may optimize an well, what was it? We do optimize an objective. That's what I mean. Classic, and I love, I love Google Maps because it saves me from getting lost. So what does that do? Find a sequence of streets, those are your choices, all the possible streets, that my car can drive from point A to point B. So those are the constraints, they can be drive, it cannot be opposite direction, etc. in, I want to go fast, so the shortest time. That's a possibility. Another, there's so many problems like this are everywhere. Another one, give me the plan, optimal design uh, plan layout. What I want to do is to do what? I want to find a mapping of equipment. They give me the equipment, and I need to find the coordinates, whether in the floor, up there, whatever, and the rotation. So what positions, so that makes the plant safe and maintainable. There's constraints for safety and maintenance, and with the smallest cost combinatorial optimization problems. If you think in terms of software, this translates to what? It translates to parameters, that's the input, input data, the choices. What are the streets, what is the equipment, what are the positions? Variables, the things that I need to decide, the sequence of streets, the mapping of equipment to positions, the constraints, and an objective, right? That's the kind of thing. Fine, that, you know, I don't see any problems for now. Great, um, how do we do this? Well, it's mostly academics, us. Um, there's also software engineers who do it. But when we think about this, we academics do what? Well, we think about how to define these things, how to define the parameters, the variables, the constraints, and the objectives, and how, in a group, we usually find a modeling language with which to build a model. And this model looks very much like a, a program with its parameters, its constraints for all, A keys do this, and uh, this has to be true, and this has to be true, etc. And I also, well, in the modeling language, there could be many languages, Minisync, in example, in a sense, but we use Minisync because that's the one that we do in our group. And we also parameterize or format the data. And the combination of those two things, the model and the data, gives us an instance. So for example, a particular instance of the car is when I go from Clayton to Caulfield. Or another instance is when I go from Clayton to my house. Each of them requires a different data. And this is what is called an instance. Fine. And then, because I'm using a high-level modeling language that uses very high-level kind of mathematical constraints, then I need my modeling language to compile it down into something. And that something is something that the solvers, like Ruby, so you'll have a solver like Ruby, Cplex, whatever, we could be uh, glucose if you're talking about SAT constraints, you can have GCode or Chaff if you're talking about constraint programming, or you can talk about Ruby, Cplex if you're talking about uh, MIP or MILP. Fine. So this is basically that, that uh, solver readable code is the similar to the assembler, to your program, Java program or Python program or all those things, right? So you have from the high level all the way down. Great. And then you get the solution. And you give it back. I still don't see any problem, any trouble. This is great. We have models. We have instances. It goes. It gives you a solution. That's awesome. Yes, that's awesome. What's the problem? So why are we talking about feasibility restoration? Because sometimes, uh, well, first of all, because I forgot about the main thing. The main thing is not the academics, it's the end users. And those end users are going to want to use the system. And if we are good, we're not going to give them the data. We're going to give them a proper user interface, something powerful, something that they can use to do what? Well, to give our values and modify them on the fly and try different scenarios. And also, modify the constraints and the objective. What if I turn this on? And what if I turn this off? And what, if I... and what happens when that happens? <laughs> well, when I, that gives the instance and is combined to the model, my system will often say, no. And if you think that that is, even if it's, the model is totally correct, no problem whatsoever. The model is correct, there's just 
no solution because the problem is infeasible. And Google says this often. Oh, not that often, actually. But it did say to me when I asked him to go from Melbourne to Spain, get to Madrid in a car. And he went, he did that same thing that said, sorry, we could not calculate the driving directions from Clayton to Spain. Well, that is basically, uh, because it's not telling me two very important things. The first one is that why? why? Why is it? Well, because there's no land connecting. The second one is that actually there's a way of solving it. I could go by plane. I could go by, by a boat. So it doesn't allow me to understand, and it doesn't allow me to resolve the issue. And that's what I want. What I want something that gives me inkling onto why, what is the source of the infeasibility, and then it helps me restore the feasibility. And further than that, I'm going to want a human center, and we'll see why. OK, so my motivated workflow, what I want for all combinatorial problems is that I give it to a user, the user gives me the data, and if the system goes, Hoo -hoo, I have a feasibility, I have a solution, it gives it to me. And otherwise, I want to do something that helps that user understand the errors and tell it how, is it how they need to modify in Google, I need to change the click from the car to the click to the plane. And then it gives me a solution. And then I get a proper, so a, 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 an actual solution. I restore feasibility. OK, so what do people do in this kind of time? Yeah, that's good. OK, what do people do in a state of the art? Well, there's two main approaches to this, what academics do. And they're both very academic. Uh, you will see what I mean. First, enumeration. So the idea is that if I have a, a huge set of constraints, uh, academics we usually don't think in terms of applications, just a simple set of constraints, then what? I want to find a minimal unsatisfiable uh, subset, minimal unsatisfiable set. What does that mean? What I want to find is something there, four constraints, each of those lines is a constraint. I want to find four constraints such that if I choose any of them and I take it off, those four constraints which were unsatisfiable by themselves suddenly become satisfiable. The three remaining become satisfiable. And it doesn't matter which one I choose. Any of them, if I take it out, the rest is satisfiable. So it's kind of the, it's like in a bag, when you're trying to figure out a bag, is the smallest part where you, the bag is, right? OK, now, um, there's, there could be a lot of masses. It doesn't have to be one. It could be lots of them through your, because you have many bags, so you have many issues. Some of them might be uh, overlapping. And they have some constraints that are in the middle. Great, so that's your, your masses. And you can enumerate all the masses, but they're all means to an end. I want to find a minimal correction subset. What does that mean? I want to find something that the set of constraints that if I, I need to change in order to restore feasibility. And since I might have lots, lots of bugs, my masses, I need to select one um, constraint from each mass that I'm going to modify to get a solution. Yeah. And that can be different. I can choose that, or I can choose, ah, I want the other way. Doesn't matter. So that is my model. Now I'm in an application with, I have lots of constraints in assembler, right? In the, in the equivalent of assembler, in the flat sync. And my solver, I, I want to find a way of finding all the masses and then allowing the user to um, select an MCS so they can actually change it and find the solution. So I can enumerate all, I can enumerate one, I can enumerate some of them. There's, this gives you choice. And there's lots of different tools for doing this. Um, the one that Minisync has is find mass. We also have used Grobi. Grobi has a way of finding one single mass. A find mass can enumerate all of them. Issues. Well, in real life, when you have in, in Google, in this particular case, there will be one single mass. In a plan layout or something like that, you have a massive amount of them, and they are really overwhelming for users. Very large number. To compute and enumerate, particularly if you want to find all, takes forever. Um, connecting the high level, well, actually, connecting the user interface, which is what the user sees, all the way down to the flat sync or assembler equivalent, not easy. They don't do it. And it doesn't. Uh, this is the equivalent of telling you there's no land connection between Australia and Madrid, but it doesn't tell you how to fix it. So, second method. Second method does tell you how to fix it. 
is what we call soft generation. So this reformulates constraints, adding basically softens constraints, adding what is called a slack variable. So if you have something like that, a linear, you know, very simple linear constraint, AX, let's or equal to B, it's simply softened by adding a new positive variable, which is called the slack, and that kind of catches the error, right? That's simple, that's it. And the objective is change. Rather than trying to minimize the shortest time between A and B or minimize the cost, what you try to minimize is, for example, the number of slacks that are positive. And that gives you a, a, a correction set, the, the things, the actual constraints that you need to minimize, that you need to change, sorry. Um, I mean, a cardinality. Or you can say, I want to minimize the sum of the values. So I don't want to change a lot of things. So just give me the, the minimum number of, of, uh, of values, the minimum amount of values that I need to change. Or you can say, min max, I don't want to change anything too much. Just give me little, little things. Lots of different possibilities. Um, and the idea is that this, this is the thing that says, hey, take a, uh, a plane, right? That's the restoration. Then you go and you take that value and that's what you plug in the user interface with a new value and hopefully get a solution. So that what is gives you the restoration. One gives you the choice, the other one the restoration. And what? There's a few tools that do this. Gurobi does this, but mostly it's done manually. Issues, same as before, difficult to connect higher level to lower level. The lack of choice, if you get a single MCS, that's just one way that you could boil. It's like telling you you have to go by boat. Well, I would have wanted to know that I won't, can't go by plane. Um, unnecessary large curve slack values if you choose the second one, and a large number of constraints with slack uh, greater than zero if you choose the third. And also, there was no such uh, method for logic constraint, which is what we deal mostly in constraint programming, so we had to extend it to that. OK, so now we know what on earth we're talking about. Restoring the feasibility of, constraint, of, of optimization problems. Who cares? The users care, mostly. And why is it important? Because if they, they say, and nothing else, they stop using <laughs> the, the user interface. Um, so what is our goal? Our goal is to, first, do a system that is problem independent, that I can use for every combinatorial optimization or combinatorial problem. Second. Do it that is human-centered. And what do I mean by this? Well, this is, the, uh, this is an important part. Being problem independent means that you don't have to do it every time for every single application, a particular implementation. Being human-centered means that I want it to be practical. What does that mean? Huh? It depends on the user. Not on, wow, I'm talking very slowly. It not only depends on the user, but it also depends on the time. In the morning, the user might decide that it has only two minutes. In the after lunch, it can take an hour while it's on lunch. On the evening, it might take the entire day for the rest of the day. It needs to be meaningful. It needs to be meaningful for the user, not for the modeler, not for the academic. It needs to be flexible. So sometimes they have time, sometimes they have no time, sometimes they want choice, sometimes they don't want choice, and it needs to be able to, to choose it. And it needs to be useful okay, for them, as in repairing, guiding them to, to do. So the main contributions are in the paper, I'm not gonna, uh, which is almost about to, to, to be published uh, online. Um, so I'm not going to go through there, but I'm going to give you a high-level flavor in the three minutes that I have. Um, so remember, user interface, instant generation, solver, and compiler, and solver. So, uh, and this is my, uh, what, what we would want the user to do, go from input to output, or review and repair. The first thing that we do is the, that's the normal thing. Everyone does the traditional. You give everything, and everything goes well. Woohoo! You get a solution. Or we have built a huge amount of things. You don't need to know what that is, but it's an enormous amount of things to be able to do four main things. A path. When things go wrong, a path that allows you to very quickly, um, with limited choice, but very quickly figure out what the problem is. Another one that is very slow much lower, well, it's not very slow, but it can be much lower, and, uh, but it gives you lots of choice, and something in between, in the middle. And also, we have done an entire system to be able to repair, and to say, for this one, give me a solution and see how, give me, give me an idea for, for how much I have to change the data to become, again, feasible. Okay, so the first thing is practicality versus flexibility. That is the idea of I'm combining, I'm using soft generation on itself, enumeration on itself, and combination of the two. This allows us to provide users with a single um, correction set or a single 
um, um, minimum satisfiable set or multiple. And if they that gives them practicality and, and uh, flexibility. And if they decide to go for choice, then we allow them to design an MCS and we guide them through it. So it gives their usability. And we have three different problem independent visualizations that they can use. The first one is just textual. There's two, set one and set two, the different masses, and that has a lot of different constraints. And as you can see, it gives you a type. That's the high level type of constraint. You might be talking about the minimum distance constraint, or you might be talking about the group size constraint. It tells you what uh, elements in the plan layout it's talking about. It's talking about two particular um, pieces of equipment, and it's telling you what the problem is, that there's a, this minimum distance is the problem. Okay, that, and you can click the things, see the values, etc. Textual. Second one, graphical. This one is, from my point of view, much more, uh, um, well, actually all of them help. Um, masses in the middle. That's, this is an example in which there's six masses, minimum satisfiable set, up there on the top right, you get the kind of constraints, kind that the user has told you that they're interested in, the group size, the maximum distance, minimum distance, etc. Uh, on the right-hand side, the assembly and the group and the pipes are the objects that those constraints are talking about. They're talking about this particular pipe, this particular piece of equipment. And on the left-hand side, it's talking about subsets of constraints that appear in those masses. And the entire point of them is to click in this particular case, we have click, Oy! oh wow, that is fancy. We have click on that one, and that has lit up all the, you see all the green um, edges connect to the masses saying, I appear in this mass, and I also appear in this mass, and there's intersections. So just by fixing that one, I lit up all by one mass. What it tells to the user is now, I just need to pick one of the other ones that are appearing in that mass and life follow, oh, I just need to pick one of those guys. So I can pick group size or maximum size and I'm done. After that, I said solve and it, it softens there, it relaxes, adds some slack variables and tells me values. Yes. Okay. And I also, uh, we also had a network. In this case, we don't uh, look at constraints, we look at objects. And those are the objects of the plant. And it says basically the same things, but in graphical form from the point of view of the plant. I'm almost there, 17 minutes. <laughs> um, putting it all together, we have an input, user interface. If it gets a solution, that's great. If not, we can report all the issues and allow the users to, to um, click the appropriate constraints that they want to change among all the possible choice. And then the soft says, this is the value by which you have to change. You need to change the minimal distance by at least 50. You, need, you can do whatever, you, you can change it by more, but at least 50. And then you repair. And that gives you, the first one gives you practicality and flexibility, the second one meaningfulness, and the last one is the usefulness part. Now, since we have done this for three different applications, hydrogen, I cannot go backwards, which is a little bit annoying. Oh yeah, let me see. Aha. Hydrogen supply chain, we have done for that one, as in it works for every uh, problem, um, um, water management and plan layout. And we have a website where you can see for Knapsack and for um, um, Sudoku, how it works and what kind of things it tells you. So it's, it's kind of fun. And uh, the only thing that the academics, that the users have to, the academics and the users have to do is to talk to the users, figure out what are the uh, constraints that can fail, the foreground, and the ones that cannot fail, and they are the base knowledge, figure out, and those, yeah, Annotate the foreground model constraints and modify the user interface to do it. That's it. And then it works for all that. We have done a lot of work for that. And that's pretty much it. I'm going to go. We have done a, a qualitative user study of the different visualizations, and it was really uh, good. And that's it. One minute over. Uh, Maria, as an any good conference, we're running over time, of course. Yeah. And I was, in fact, trying to steal a couple of seconds from you, but you didn't let me. Very good. That's so good. we should take time anyway for uh, two questions, maybe. And uh, so we have one question here, Hamid. Maybe uh, can you please wait until the microphone arrives? It's up here. Hamid. Um, thanks, Maria. A very great talk. Um, I have just a question. Is there any way 
this uh, repair, like, okay, there's lots of way to repair it, and then you give flexibility to user to choose. Is there any way to give recommendation or rank them or I mean, uh, based on the objective, which is maybe cost or something? Okay. Very good question. Uh, there is actually some papers that talk about preferences. Yes. Right? So they allow the users to give preferences on the type of constraints. Um, and then, yes, the, the system underneath Find Mass, which was developed by, by Kevin Leo, can take some of those preferences in, into account by doing a bit of hierarchy. In theory, that works well. In practice, Getting your users to even tell you what the foreground and the background is, is difficult. Given the, asking them for pre preferences means that they know them. Um, and it can, it, it can mean that they end up being presenting solutions that they really didn't want, be, but they didn't know that they didn't want them. But yes, they ca it can be done. It just, we haven't implemented it just yet. It's for, for our, our um, partners, uh, external partners, um, as I said, for now, we're just trying to get them to tell us what constraints are the ones that can change and what are the ones. But yes. Thank you. Uh, so maybe one more quick question, Gianfe. Thanks for this uh, nice talk. So um, I'm just more thinking about future, right? So, oh. so suppose you solve this kind of optimization problems uh, different but similar problems, I mean, for 1,000 times. So you have 1,000 this kind of optimization examples that day. So is it possible to, to learn a foundation model like ChatGPT? So in the future, you can sort of using such a machine learning or AI model to tell you what could be the possible solutions that day, and then you try to optimize within that kind of uh, space. Uh, there has been, uh, so that is a completely different, uh, it's not about feasibility restoration, yes. There has been uh, research on um, using um, uh, using a lot of, of uh, um, runs. Now, in order to have runs, you need to have data, right? As in different um, 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 instances, different instances that you're going to train. Um, in, in a lot of, uh, of, of real world um, problems, the kind of the ones that are exploration that require the real exploration, that's not common to have a lot of them. But assuming that you have them, uh, you can do a lot of things. You can, there's people who are trying to infer models automatically. There's people who are trying to infer what are the best solving model, models, not just the solvers, but also the heuristics to, to do the search. There's people who are trying to, to figure out um, portfolio, um, um, uh, th there's all kinds of things. Uh, uh, and there is, in particular, what we're trying to do is from instances, a few instances, not a massive amount of instances, because it's not uh, machine learning that we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is to infer knowledge about the model that you can use to transform the model to run faster. Most academics go through the, I want this to run faster. Right? No, I want this to be more meaningful for the end users because that is a more, you know. Uh, you, I want it to run faster. And for that, we do a lot of what we call instance-based analysis, that we analyze the instance, we abstract it to the model level, and then we transform the model based on that information to run faster or to... Um, to, to change the objective function to, to be faster, to change the constraints to, to be faster, etc., Or to actually tell the user, um, you could change in this way, do you want to? That kind of thing. Okay. But yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you again, Maria, for a great talk. <laughs>